The Force Awakens does something that fundamentally changes how we understand Star Wars. Or rather, it should fundamentally change how we understand Star Wars. Strangely, the filmmakers seem unaware of the rather profound implications this new narrative has for the rest of their cinematic universe. In fact, one of the major plot points in Episode 7 inadvertently sets up something of a stormtrooper paradox. To explain what I mean by that, I want to focus in on two scenes near the very beginning of Force Awakens that signal this shift in the Star Wars mythos. First, we see a stormtrooper bleeding. For a franchise about intergalactic war, very little blood is ever shown on screen. And when it is, it holds a special significance. I love you. I know. Hands up! In this case, the bloody fingerprints mark this particular soldier as important. Second, a short time later, we see that same stormtrooper take off his helmet to reveal a human face, and one clearly disturbed by recent events. The removal of a mask to expose someone's true humanity is a recurring motif in the Star Wars series. And we've seen hundreds if not thousands of stormtroopers before, but we've never seen one with a face. Both of these scenes communicate that under their iconic armor, stormtroopers are people. People with feelings and who feel pain, both physically and emotionally. The result is that The Force Awakens does something no other movie in this long-running franchise has ever done before. It humanizes stormtroopers. To understand why this revelation is so important and how it impacts the rest of the Star Wars mythology, we're going to need a quick history lesson. In the Star Wars cinematic universe, stormtroopers are the army of the Galactic Empire. They're an intergalactic military force synonymous with space imperialism and oppression. They're said to be brutal, precise, and loyal soldiers who have undergone extensive military training. And these Last points, too accurate for sand people. Only Imperial stormtroopers are so precise. Now, despite their role as foot soldiers of intergalactic authoritarianism, stormtroopers have become some of the most recognizable pop culture icons on Earth. The name stormtrooper is borrowed from special divisions of German soldiers during World War I. Translated from the original German, these soldiers were known as storm men. They were aggressive and heavily armed assault troops organized into companies known as storm troopers. Storm man would later become a paramilitary rank in the Nazi SS under Adolf Hitler. In George Lucas's much maligned prequels, the predecessors to storm troopers are introduced in the form of the Republic's clone army. Clone soldiers were made to order fighting machines all sharing the same genes and the same face. They are totally obedient to taking any order without question. By the time the original trilogy rolls around, clone soldiers have been phased out, and the ranks of the new Imperial Stormtroopers are made up of conscripts and volunteers. Look, sir, droid! Now fast forward to Episode 7, and the First Order also uses regiments of Stormtroopers. Here we're told that many of them were kidnapped as children and brainwashed into loyal fighters. I'm a stormtrooper. Like all of them, I was taken from a family I'll never know and raised to do one thing. Essentially, they're child soldiers, which I think is especially noteworthy considering the only stormtrooper face we've ever seen belongs to a young black man. Every other stormtrooper has no face, no name, and no individuality. They are completely dehumanized. Across eight feature films, they're portrayed as little more than disposable grunts. <laughs> FN2187, or Finn as he's eventually known in Episode 7, is the only exception. 
Finn is an Imperial defector who joins the Resistance. Obviously. Yes, I am. I'm with the Resistance, yeah. I am with the Resistance. He's funny, he's emotional, hey, he's brimming with great. personality. You're a pilot. You can fly anywhere. Why go back? You got a family? You got a boyfriend? Cute boyfriend? None of your business, that's why. Not exactly the characteristics you'd expect from someone kidnapped and brainwashed from an early age. But setting that aside, Finn is the only stormtrooper out of presumably millions who we see develop a conscience. Are we to believe he's the only one with the ability to resist First Order programming? Well, no, it's possible for other soldiers to reject their conditioning. In fact, the First Order has a protocol for exactly this kind of non-compliance. FN-2187 reported to my division, was evaluated and sent to reconditioning. No prior signs of non-conformity. This was his first offense. General. And yet Finn rebels anyway. Finn's very existence stands in contrast to the rest of the stormtroopers in The Force Awakens. I mean, on the one hand, we have a likable, humanized stormtrooper who switches sides. And on the other hand, we have all his fellow stormtroopers who the Resistance kill without a second thought. And this is why it feels like the film has a confused, dissonant relationship to one of its own plot points. Why it feels like it doesn't really buy into its own premise. Because if Finn can remain so very human despite years of programming and conditioning, then that must mean the same could be true for all other stormtroopers. Unfortunately, the writers responsible for this movie don't seem at all interested in pursuing any of the morally complex questions that arise from this fact, preferring instead to indulge in more action scenes built around blasting more mindless automatons. Can I try that? In fact, blasting stormtroopers has become so mundane that it's an in-universe joke, often played for laughs. I like this thing. Stormtroopers are framed as easy to kill, both literally and figuratively, and they are killed a lot. Over the course of The Force Awakens' 2 hour and 15 minute runtime, we see a total of 68 stormtroopers shot, stabbed, or vaporized. And those are just the ones that we can see die on screen. Again, these are child soldiers that we're talking about here. Which is even more reason for the film to at least acknowledge the underlying tragedy of their circumstances. But it never does. I mean, it's easy to imagine a more emotionally complex plotline, perhaps something that focuses on a group of disillusioned stormtroopers who organize a resistance cell to subvert the First Order, but from the inside. Remember that Finn's awakening is triggered not by the death of some innocent villager, but by the death of his friend, a fellow stormtrooper. This is the event that quite literally leaves a mark on him. And yet, the film quickly forgets this key transformative moment. Because minutes later, we see Finn whooping and laughing while blasting his former teammates. Now, you might say that Finn and the rest of the Resistance are acting in self-defense. And you'd be right. I mean, Star Wars is, after all, a story about Resistance. And when faced with an oppressive police or military force, sometimes violence may be necessary to achieve liberation. But having to hurt one group of people in order to help another is always a tragic trade-off, even if it's necessary. If there's a core message to Finn's redemption story in The Force Awakens, something that the film really wants us to believe in, it's that people can change. And if we accept that, then the possibility must also exist for other stormtroopers to change as well. Now perhaps their transformation is unlikely, but not any more unlikely than Finn's own awakening. 
And isn't that the idea at the heart of the original Star Wars trilogy? I know there is good in you. The Emperor hasn't driven it from you fully. That there still exists good in even someone as evil as Darth Vader? Because if that's the case, and I think it is, You were right about me. Then that means the fall of every stormtrooper represents the death of the possibility of redemption. The possibility of another Finn. If you'd like to see more long-form video essays that focus on the intersections of entertainment and politics, head over to my Patreon page and help fund the Pop Culture Detective Agency.